What's going on, everybody? A lot of mixed reactions to this Jets draft class, and I'm not going to stamp any grades on it. I think that's kind of a silly exercise for, for obvious reasons, but I do want to debunk what I find to be a few myths about this Jets draft class. There's a lot of criticism from, of course, the mainstream sports media, and some Jets fans are pretty underwhelmed. Number one, I think that we have 2022 draft hangover, right? We had two top 10 picks last year and then two more picks at the end of the first top of the second round so of course the talent overall in last year's draft and the amount of ridiculous draft capital compounded by the amount of needs we had on last year's roster it was just never going to live up to getting the offensive and defensive rookie of the year in one draft in the top 10 that's the first thing and one of the biggest criticisms i've seen is that the jets didn't come away with a big impact player year one. We're in a, a win now mode with Aaron Rodgers for a two to three year window. And we need guys who can come in and play right now. And I, I just don't see how that's true at all. The only case that could be made for that is with the first round pick and Will McDonald, who, yes, it is true. I don't see a path to Will McDonald getting on the field you know, 50 plus percent of the snaps this year. If our edge room is healthy, which of course uh, we hope it is. Jermaine Johnson, first round pick last year was cracking about a third of the snaps. So that's probably where McDonald is going to be. But we got to give some arguments of who we could have taken that would have been more of a high impact player. And we'll talk more about McDonald in a little bit because the more I've watched him, the more I've come to really like this young man. And once all those top four tackles were gone, which yes, I was adamant. I was hoping one of those four tackles would be there. I was hoping we'd walk away with Darnell Wright or Broderick Jones. But once that didn't happen, you're there at 15. Well, now we're just comparing Will McDonald to the players who are still left on the board at that point. And JSN was someone I was hoping for and Kalijah Canty. Those are the, really the only two names that you could think of that you could make an argument would have a higher impact year one. And I'm not even sure if JSN fits that bill because this is going to be seen as a hot take, although, although it's not. If JSN is drafted, you likely move on from Corey Davis, either cutting him or trading him for next to nothing. Now, do I think predict that JSN will have a better career as a receiver than Corey Davis? I do. Do I think if the Jets drafted JSN, he would be better than Corey Davis by his third year in the league? Yes. Would he have been better than Corey Davis by his second year in the league? Yes. Would JSN, rookie JSN, be a better wide receiver than healthy Corey Davis? I don't know that that's the case. And that's not a hot take because healthy Corey Davis with a quarterback who can play, we know can get you eight, 900 yards. And if the Seattle Seahawks, if you told them right now, you're getting eight, 900 yards from rookie JSN, they're signing on the dotted line right now. Well, Corey Davis has been injured. Well, so was JSN. <laughs> JSN was last year too. So if JSN's really talented. I would have been really excited about that pick. But as the roster is currently constructed, it, your, your wide receiver room is really, really solid. How much of an upgrade is rookie JSN over Corey Davis. If we're, if we're just talking about immediate impact, you can't statistically make an argument when looking at when Corey Davis was asked to play a wide receiver two role in a functioning offense that you know JSN could get you that production. We can't make that argument. Now, the other guy, Kalijah Kansi, I think you could definitely make that argument for because there is a, as this roster sits right now, there is a clear path where he would come in and have a carved out role, getting the second most snaps of any defensive tackle outside of Quinn and Williams. So there is that. There's also the fact that Kalijah Canty to me is boom or busty. I think way more boom, really like the player, but you're betting on a physical outlier to the extreme extreme. There's never been a defensive tackle in NFL history who has had a successful career with that short of an arm length that Kalijah Canty does. And I, this is going to be kind of a, a rambly video. Don't have a ton of bulleted notes. It's going to be a little bit longer, but I really want to go through uh, the ins and outs of this draft class. I think it's a sneaky good class. So now that we've debunked that myth and even, Hey, even the offensive tackles as the roster sits right now, <laughs> um, I do believe an offensive tackle would have played, especially Skoronsky, Darnell Wright, Paris Johnson, who was always a dream because they have guard versatility. Those guys would have been on the field a lot, a lot more than Will McDonald. Yes, that is true. But even Broderick Jones, who was the guy we got sniped for, who's a pure left tackle, and Dwayne Brown, who up until last year just doesn't miss snaps at all, 
there's a chance that Broderick Jones was maybe, I don't know, spot starting for injury. Maybe Becton's hurt, whatever. And he plays 30% of the snaps. Like that was a possibility. And that might be where Will McDonald is around. So uh, we got to give some alternatives when we're saying that Will McDonald is not a high impact player right away. And I think the only player who is still left on the board that you could 100% make that argument for was Kalijah Kansi. And now let's talk about Will McDonald because uh, I'll admit the the pick came in and for like 30 minutes, I was pretty ticked off. Hadn't watched him, uh, really watched him passively. I'm just on broadcast from what I remember. But now I've gone back and watched uh, eight games. Well, seven and a half. I'm at uh, halftime of Oklahoma. Uh, just finished Texas. And I'm really impressed by this guy. I really, really am. And when we, when I first made the video about him, I said that he was also a little bit boomer busty just based on the the physical profile of maybe not really being a good run defender and you're you're all in on hoping those pass rush tools translate to the next level. But I actually take that back. I think I was just talking out of my behind, to be honest, just to be early and get content out, just to be full, fully transparent with you guys. Because now after really watching him, uh, getting my hands on some Iowa State All-22, which to be fair is more than most people who will give their takes on Twitter will do, not that I'm a trained scout. But look, one of the most underrated parts about his game is the instincts, the awareness, and the tackling in space. Those aren't traditionally things that you think of when you think of an edge rusher. You don't think of it as a cerebral position, but he knows what he's doing. There's Against Texas, there was multiple tackles for loss against Bijan Robinson where he's engaged with the blocker, but he still has his eyes in the backfield. He's he's He has a sense of where the running lanes are going to create, and he disengages at the last second, makes the tackle, again, with incredible length and really good tackling, that's going to help against the run. Carl Lawson is a bull in a China shop. Shop. He's a dog. The bull rush is great. You love it. But there was a lot of big runs that were sprung by Carl Lawson just being out of position and having those alligator arms and not being able to make a tackle. I think you can make the case that Will McDonald might have the most balanced skill set of any of our edge players. He really might. If a 3-4 Defense took him. I think you'd see him dropping uh, as a line as a linebacker in coverage. Like if this was Rex Ryan, this dude's dropping back and and probably getting like an interception per year with that length and that awareness. Now that's not what we're going to do in our defense. It's a little bit more simple. He's just going to pin his ears back and go get the quarterback. And there's really good tools there as well. He has a plan. He has a bag. the The spin move is nasty. The speed and rip. Uh, the the bend where he's got his body at like a 30 degree freaking angle and he's still pushing forward and the ability to get off blocks and disengage, which again is something that I think Jermaine Johnson and Carl Lawson who are much stronger struggle to do. Sometimes they get, it's like they're super glued to the, the offensive lineman with, with Lawson and JJ, even though they're driving back, the ability to disengage at the last second and the long arms are going to make him a, a strip sack artist. When I first watched him, I thought, there was a, some Hassan Reddick there, which maybe is a little bit of an unfair expectation. Hassan Reddick led the league in sacks last year, but Chris Sims, uh, who's been really high on this guy for a long time, Chris Sims made the Leonard Floyd comparison. I was like, oh, that is perfect. That is such a good comp. The, a little light, but super long, who has enough play strength to play well against the run and enough awareness to give you value outside of just rushing the passer and get you that eight, nine sacks a year maybe pops and gets you 11 this year and makes a pro bowl and leonard floyd was good enough to get 65 million dollars a year from a, a good team in the la Rams. so those 15 sack you know bosa's and got and miles garrett's and will anderson's those guys are top five picks if you're getting that um in the middle of the first round that's a good that's a good pick and we don't have anybody on this jets defensive edge room that you would look at right now and bet the over on like seven and a half sacks and be really confident. We don't have anyone like that. And maybe Will McDonald could be that for the long term for the Jets. And good teams draft one year ahead of need at premium positions. Edge is a premium position. It's one year ahead of need where Carl Lawson and Bryce Huff are on the last year of their contracts. JFM, you don't want to be paying him 15 million forever. Um, Will McDonald, you can't overthink this. If he's a good, really good football player, 
it's a really good pick. I'm not going to panic about the opportunity cost. I think he got a really good football player. That is the goal of the draft. The Jets have had 16 first round picks in the last 11 seasons, and only one of them was worth giving a second contract to. If this kid's a good football player, it's a good pick. I'm really excited to see him on the football field. Next, Joe Tipman. This will be shorter because <laughs> there's no controversial takes to give here. This is a slam dunk home run pick. Now, John Michael Schmitz was many people's favorite center and maybe the best center in a power man scheme. But I, I do think that Joe Tipman might have been a better fit for the Jets because he is more athletic, has better get off than John Michael Schmitz. He's also two years younger. So I think Schmitz is probably a tad more pro ready. But I expect Joe Tipman to have a really good shot to beat out Connor McGovern and be the day one starting center. And it, it's, if you get a day one starter at pick 43 in the draft, whatever position in it, it is, unless it's kicker or whatever, that's a good pick. It's a good pick. So uh, again, the critique of you don't get an immediate impact players. You just got a day one starting offensive lineman for Aaron Rodgers. And I don't think that the Chiefs regret spending a second round pick on Creed Humphrey. The, the Ravens going in the first round with Tyrell Linderbaum, such an undervalued position. And he's a tone setter. He plays with that mean streak that this offensive line ha has lacked. Uh, kind of that Ryan Jensen energy. It might cost you a, a personal foul <laughs> at some point in the year, uh, but it's worth it, man. And when remember when Zach Wilson was getting ragdolled and late hit and nobody was doing anything? Well, now obviously with guys like Uzama and Lakin and Joe Titman, he's a dog. And the only knock that people have on him is that he might be too tall. And I talked to uh, buddy Joe Blewett, Jet X Factor, who is, um, you know, we both watch the film, but he knows what he's watching more than I do. And he says, hey, man, in our scheme, that's not as big of a deal. Uh, the leverage um, lost a pad level with height is not as big of a deal in his own scheme. It's about the athleticism to get to your spot uh, more so in this system. And I love it. I think he was 1A, 1B with Schmitz. You get your long-term center for the first time since Nick Mangold. Hope he's here 10 years. And we have a center with a mullet. And a center with a mullet increases your Super Bowl chances by 30%. According to Pro Football Focus. All right. Uh, next, Carter Warren, tackle from Pitt. It, again, debunking the myth that it's not an immediate impact player. Yes, it is. Of course it is. This is in the mid rounds. I think he's a backup. I'll start there. I think he's a career backup. Now, the the foot speed, the athletic traits, I don't think he has the chops to most likely be a starter in, in any scheme. I'm not trying to put ceilings on, on the guys. I thought the same thing about Max Mitchell last year, and he immediately looked better than I, I ever thought he would. So I am hope I'm wrong, and then this kid's a starter, but just give him my opinion. Point being, even if he's not a starter, you can draft long-term backups at premier positions in the fourth round, and that's fine. If you're taking a guard or a center or an off-ball linebacker or a safety in the fourth round, you'd like to convince yourself that maybe they can develop into a starter by year three or whatever. But at left tackle, dude, Give me a backup who's making no money and, and let's go. Here's what he is. He is a battle tested pass protecting left tackle. And he played at Pitt and the Jets like Pitt. All right. We got Izzy who we'll talk about next, but he didn't play in some gimmicky like Tennessee offense where he never had to block a, a seven step drop in his life. And it's all RPO and you're, and you're massively projecting even, even darn all right. Now he's not on the same stratosphere of talent at Darnell Wright, but even Darnell Wright, there's some projection there in terms of how long he's going to be able to hold up against um, five, seven step drops. Got this from Michael Nania in 2021. He had the most true pass set snaps out of any tackle in the country battle tested and probably would have gone higher if not for the injury, but it wasn't an ACL blowout. It was a meniscus tear in like week five. So he should be good to go. What he is, is if Dwayne Brown has to miss a month like he did last year, you can put him in. You're going to get a massive drop off in the run game, but he is going to keep Aaron Rodgers clean. That's what you're getting here in the fourth round. And I think that's good value. Next, this is just a certified absolute steal. There is nothing bad you could say about Izzy Abanaconda from University of Pitt running behind Carter Warren. Man, a absolute home run scheme fit the just like mcdonald talking about the physical tools but there 
again, there is the patience, the vision, and the decisiveness that I think make him a perfect fit. Some of the things that drove me crazy with Michael Carter last year when he's drifting outside of the blocks, and I'm like, Michael, there's the lane. Stick your foot in the ground and hit it. He's going to do that. Stylistically, he is similar to Bam Knight, but has a whole extra gear. Um, Connor Rogers made the pro comp a throwback of Willie Parker. Remember with the Pittsburgh Steelers? Love that pro comp. Not super elusive in space. Not going to be not a super dynamic threat as a receiver out of the backfield. Doesn't truck stick people in terms of power. He is just, here's the gap and I'm faster than you. And I have enough strength to run through arm tackles. And I am a home run threat on any given play. I think there's a chance. Michael Carter looked pretty rough last year and Bam Knight was solid, but I think, I think Izzy has a, another gear than Bam Knight. And there's a chance he touches the football more than anyone on the jets, not named Aaron Rodgers or Brees Hall. If he gets six or seven touches a game, that's a hundred to 120 touches a year. Is Garrett Wilson catching 120 passes? So the, again, the immediate impact thing is completely debunked. You're getting what could be a running back to home run weapon for Aaron Rodgers in the fifth round, right after you got a immediate backup left tackle and a plug and play starting center. This is big time immediate impact for rosters that actually have talent. If you're getting your starting left tackle, like if Carter Warren is your starting left tackle at pick 120, your team sucks. Our team does not suck. Uh, next, I'm going to put Zach Kuntz here first because he's the last of the players that I've actually watched. The other two players I have to go uh, try and dig up some film on. But <laughs> my goodness, if you're going to throw a dart, how about throwing a dart on one of the top 10 most absurd athletic profiles of a tight end to ever declare for the draft. You're talking the, the Vernon Davis, Jimmy Graham level of, of freak show, Mike Kosicki level of freak show at tight end. Well, why is he there in the seventh round? Number one, obviously he's a way better football player than he is an athlete. He can't block for crap and he's got a knee injury. So we'll just get that out of the way of why is he not, why is he there in the seventh round? He said the kneecap is good to go by the way, but Six, seven, 255, the 40, the bench, the broad jump, the vertical, the 10 split, the 20 split, the, the cone, everything is in the elite stratosphere. And, and this is where I'm fine throwing a dart on traits. I don't want to do it with Ashton Davis in the third round where you just, hey, this guy has no feel for the game, but I'm going to take him in the third round because he runs fast in shorts. I'm not doing that in the third round. So I didn't like the Ashton Davis pick, but in the seventh round, why not? Why the hell not? Now he's the contested catch percentage isn't as good as you'd hope for a guy who's that big. Um, doesn't really play the strong kind of like Mike Kosicki where it's like, dude, man up a little bit, right? There is some of that. So those are the reasons why he's a seventh round pick, but take a shot, take a shot at this guy who's going to be your tight end four, not going to play right away. He's going to be behind um, Uzama and Conklin and probably even Jeremy Rucker because the blocking isn't there at all, but eventually do you carve out a role for him where he plays some big slot and plays in the red zone? Why not? I love this dart throw at an absolutely absurd, absurd athlete at the tight end position in Zach Koontz. Now to round out the drafts, these two guys, again, I have not watched. So, but I, I understand the philosophy here, which is again, late Raz score, dart throws um, who can come in and compete probably to be special teams players. Zaire Barnes linebacker. Um, I hope they bring back Quan. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't want our third linebacker to be Zaire Barnes. You'd hope not, but he is right in the mold of, of Hamza Nazaldine who could be a fringe practice squad level player, maybe be your fifth linebacker. Uh, if you keep five and there's a floor there of special teams contribution, Jarek Bernard Converse, first of all, elite name. And second of all, th this reminds me of the Jason Pinnock pick, right? Where it's a, a really toolsy cornerback who lacks, who is raw in every single part of the game, but you're going to see if maybe he can convert to safety or maybe he is your like, numbers. Ideally, he's like your number six corner, your number four safety and a special teamer. I ideally. And that's a really good roster spot to spend um, late in the sixth and seventh round. I don't know. Ashton Davis and Bryce Hall are both on the last year of their contract. So could use some depth there in the secondary. I get those 
those dart throws there, but it wasn't a, I don't think it was a fully just Raz score Joe Douglas draft. In the later rounds, it was. But to me, guys like Tipman and Carter were prioritizing football players over just athletes. And McDonald, too. McDonald, too. McDonald's a pro. McDonald has, he, he doubled up the sack production of Nolan Smith. Like, Will McDonald has way more pro ready pass rush tools than Nolan Smith does. He did, it's just not debatable. And maybe Nolan Smith is better because he's a, he's a more freakish athlete. But, I don't think it was just a Raz score draft in the first half of it. We got guys who we know can play. And the last guy I'll throw up here because we're worried about defensive tackle, right? We didn't address that. The, the value for defensive tackle in this draft was not there. Once Keanu Benton wasn't the pick, I'm like, all right, we're probably not getting a defensive tackle. Um, And we do need a guy who can stop the run, but I think they're going to bring in Al Woods, Puna Ford, Linval Joseph, one of those guys to plug in and play 25% of the snaps. And then you have Quinnen, you have Quentin Jefferson, Solomon Thomas. It's not a great room. It's not a great room, uh, but it can be good enough. And this defense can still make a push to be top five. Uh, if they round out with a Quan Alexander and defensive tackle signing. So I, I don't know to, to, to put a grade on it. I, I can't really do that, but I think the, the overreaction that we didn't get immediate impact players or, or we just took a bunch of athletes who can't play football is just complete bogus. And and please, someone at least watch, at least match my sample size of watching every snap of Will McDonald for eight games and tell me why this kid it was a bad pick at 15. And tell me, uh, give me three or four names of guys on the board on the back half uh, of the draft who would have been a better pick than him and a better fit for for our team. I don't think you can make that case. And uh, thanks for hanging out. We will talk football soon. Go Jets.